Welcome to Salon Talks. I am Mary Elizabeth Williams, and this is Jemima Kirk. She is an actor, a director, and an artist. You know her from all kinds of indelible roles on girls, sex education, conversations with friends, which I loved, all kinds of great movies. And now she is co-starring in the new Apple TV Plus series based on the best-selling novel, City on Fire. Hi, Jemima. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm very well. I really enjoyed this interesting, complicated story of a very interesting and complicated moment in history in New York City. It takes place in 2003. When we first meet your character, Regan, she is, she's going through it. Your character is going through a lot with her family. Tell me about who this woman is when we meet her. I think when we meet Regan, she is someone who I think has so much going on in her life before we before the sort of storm even happens that she is on autopilot as a uh, mother and a wife and a, um, a businesswoman and uh, and all these things and I think that she has lost a, a, a sense of her, a sense of herself you know a sense of joy and a sense of um of in individuality and 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 sort of uh, her her freedom i think she's doing a lot of supposed to's right and i think that's what she's always done as a since she was a teenager and and um i i think there's two ways that you can re a kid can rebel against a um a sort of oppressive um family rich family like the one in the show which is you could go go off and become an artist on the lower east side and never speak to them again or you could go and join the family business and both of them are a way of protecting oneself right from the family it's like if it's like keeping your enemies closer and i think that's what she's done is um she's become a uh if she, you know, she's trying to prove herself that, prove to her to herself and to the business that she is a, um, that she can handle it all. You know, it's that typical sort of uh, uh, conundrum of being a, a woman who can do it all because, but we can't. Right. And then you're penalized for your own competence. And you know, when you mention all of the different iterations that Regan has in her life. I think to me, watching this show, the most interesting was she's also a sibling. She's yeah. a sister and you are famously a sibling. You are deeply interconnected in a public way with your parents, with your siblings. I was wondering if this was something that you were interested in exploring and if that was one of the things that drew you to this character, because that central dynamic is her as a sister. Yeah, it, it wasn't. And here's the thing is that I, when I play a character, the last thing I do would ever do um, is try to find a direct parallel. It's just, it doesn't really work. I've tried it before where, oh, this woman's pregnant. I've been pregnant before, I can relate. That's not where the relatability, sh in my opinion, should come from because that's Jemima being pregnant or that's Jemima as a sister. And so using my experience as a sister as a, or a sibling is not going to serve me playing Regan as a sibling. So what um, William uh, is to me, it was, you know, I, I mean, it's somewhat private, but it wasn't, uh, he wasn't in my, in my mind, he wasn't necessarily my brother, you know? But right. in writing he is, you know, and on, on in the in the story he is. Yeah, but it's it it is a really cool thing to see um, to see that kind of sibling dynamic played out in a drama in this particular way, and seeing wow. as you say the way these characters are reacting to their family and their family. Well, it's something quite romantic actually about I think this this sibling um, uh, these these two particular siblings, which is there's that the tragedy right which always brings a sense of romance and longing and um and when obviously when i say romance i don't mean incest i just mean um i just mean uh sort of 
uh, uh, almost mythical, you know, and and um, and ethereal, and um, and so deeply emotional, you know, that they're connected. They're so connected in this way that you don't. They don't bicker, you know. They don't. They don't. Uh, they don't really have a laugh about memories. We haven't seen that yet, you know. This is just uh, two people um, who really really needed needed each other need each other and miss and miss each other you know i think it could have easily played as them being um them being lovers in a different story you know yeah interesting and it's um and there are all of these other different interconnected relationships as well and your character in so many ways is central to all of these ones going off and spiraling and the show also takes place in 2003 which i almost can't believe is 20 years ago you are a new yorker i'm curious how this show and being part of going back to that period in time around actors who are the same age that you were or close to the same age you were at that time did it change how you felt about the early 2000s, pulling out the flip phones again, Bloomberg? Yeah. Air? Well, I wasn't an adult then, you know, I was what, 18, 17, 18. And I I'm really don't, I don't, I haven't done the math, so don't quote me on that. You know, but um, 2000, okay, no, I was, I was 17 slash 18. Yes, that makes sense. Um, so, so, but I didn't really get to work with, um, Chase or Wyatt, you know. Uh, so, I, I, but it was it it so it was sort of strange to be playing an adult in a time where I was doing what these characters were doing in the show, you know, um, and a bit of a reality check of how old I am, which is not. I love I love my age, but it was like oh my god, that was a long time ago. And you know when they recreated Don Hills, that was surreal, really surreal. Um, because I, that was my my favorite place to go to. Yeah, it was an interesting experience watching this and feeling that nostalgia um, for this interesting period, which was also a period of high surveillance, which was also a very paranoid moment in New York City. Some of this show takes place during the two thousand three blackout. Where were you during the blackout? Funny you should ask that, because I answered this question once before and it was not uh, received well. But it's not a bad thing. I was actually at the J Sisters uptown, if you remember it. It was really it was um, a place where you would get bikini waxes and your eye your eyebrows done and and your eyelash extensions and everything. And I was in the middle of getting a bikini wax and the lights went out right and the power went off and i was like oh my god go quick because if that wax gets cold we're screwed right so there was that and then i'm i had to walk home jay sisters uptown i lived in the west village and i had to walk home and i remember at the time people were really well people the people i knew at least were really into wearing these sort of moroccan slippers as shoes which i did and I, so they didn't have any soles on them, right? And I walked um, uh, sort of flat footed and raw. <laughs> you needed to get home and take some Advil after that. Yeah. yeah. And it was hot and it was so hot that night. Too. It was so yeah. hot. And I was like, do I hitchhike? Everyone's hitchhiking. But I, I think at one point I did hitchhike. I think it was everyone was doing it in that moment. Everyone was helping each other, but charging as well. And I didn't have cash. And this was before Uber, so it, it was kind of weird that people were driving around in their their Toyotas and being like, "Yeah, you know, forty bucks to take you to you know the West Village." The entrepreneurship. That's the spirit yeah. of, of New York City um, and of and of that moment. You know, there, when I think about this show, there's a, a moment in the first episode that I absolutely love you get some of the best lines in the whole show by the way you have some of the best lines and you get to just eat them up it's really fun watching you and there is a moment where you are angry and you were describing another character and you say what is she 23 she's all free spirited and alive i know who she was i was that girl right we all know yeah. who you are <laughs> we all know mm -hmm. that you played that 25 year old free spirited yeah. alive character that sounds yeah. a lot like Jessa from Girls. I have to ask you, 
going back and now being the woman who's looking at that character with that sense of distance and also anger and also a little bit, I think, of compassionate and wistfulness. When you think about that character that you played, I wonder how you feel about Jessa now, how you feel about who she was and what she represented to a generation of television viewers. I think Jessa was probably the only character who was somewhat aspirational for people because of this so-called free spiritedness. And I think that uh, as the show unfolded, we saw that the, what this was not a free spirited person. This was a, um, uh, an erratic and, uh, impulsive, uh, performer essentially. And, uh, and I think as the show, as the show progressed, people, um, she did become more relatable. I mean, there is, there's um there's lots of ways to be insecure and one of those ways is to act really confident and that is really who jessa was to me the whole time uh so uh but yes it to, to do to play uh that role uh as as regan and to tell to have that heartbreak of feeling like who she used to be was better than who she was is now. Um, I think I think it is immensely immensely painful because you can't go back. You don't want to go back, and to 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 feel that your you know your husband doesn't want who you are now is shattering. Yeah, it's a devastating scene, but also but you also play it in a very funny way. It's it's. Thank you. Really, really well written. You know, I mean, speaking of going back and looking at who you are now, you are always moving forward and you are moving forward on so many different fronts as a director, as as an actor. I think it was in the Town and Country interview where you said recently that you feel like maybe you've reached a point in your life where you're hard to cast. And I'm curious about what it is about this time in your life, the roles that you're looking for, the kinds of projects you want to do. What do you mm-hmm. want to do? I think I said that, and and mind you, I do um, interviews are interesting. They're sort of a permanent reminder of a temporary feeling, but that, but, you know, there's value in that as well. But I, but there is a truth to that. You know, I think people or casting directors or um, writers are, uh, you know, just starting to perhaps see me as as not someone who uh can play the a version of jessa over and over and over and i have played a version of jessa and other things you know it's what i i um i knew how to do for a long time and i'd actually be interested to see if i could still do it um but what i want to do is uh is just uh i just want to get better at what i do i really do and as i watch the show I was just, you know, artists, we're highly critical narcissists. And so we were just watching our own performance and I, and there are things I, I, uh, I want to improve upon. I don't really care what the character is. I I truly don't. I just want to get better. I like that. That's a good, uh, a good philosophy to go forward. I want to ask you one more thing, because I read that you teach a film class. You are, yeah. a, you are a, a film aficionado for yeah. those who, who can't go to your class. What is a, what is a gem or a movie that you really love that you wish people could see that maybe they haven't seen? Ah, there's so many, I don't, you know, that's like asking me what my favorite movie is, but that, but the reason I started teaching this class and it's, it's, um, it's at an organization in my neighborhood, uh, called uh rap uh the red hook art projects and it's um for the uh you know low-income housing and for the the kids of the neighborhood who can't necessarily afford to do after school stuff right and i thought that of i've been you know as i have my own kids and i see what they watch on tv and 
the the stuff that's recommended to them is going to be based on what they last watched you know and it's or it's going it's going to be new stuff right so or it's TikTok, right so these classics and these amazing movies that are totally appropriate even the ones that are appropriate for my children will can't they don't they'll they don't have an opportunity to see them you know because now they don't know about them why would they unless someone told them so i thought how fun would it be to to show a group of teenagers um you know, Goodfellas, never heard of it, never seen it, uh, or, or The Shining, you know, it, and that really excites me. You know, when I hear, when I hear that someone hasn't seen an amazing movie, I'd get jealous because I'm like, oh, you get to watch that, you know? So it's sort of, it's a book, it's like a book club for movies. We, we watch it and then the next day we talk about it. And uh, I'm just trying, what my goal is to, is to influence these kids to um to to see like that you know this this idea of the screen and watching things has has uh become this sort of lazy thing like we're being lazy we're numbing out you don't have to numb out when you watch movies it can be it's as valuable as reading a book if you're watching if you're really watching um and uh uh I just, uh, I just want them to see it. I want to see if I can get a kid to love movies as much as I do. And to love The Shining. Absolutely. Jemima, thank you so much for talking to me today. It's an absolute pleasure. The show, once again, is called City on Fire. You can watch it on Apple TV Plus. Jemima Kirk, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much.